Hello, my name is Bryn Coldrick. I'm a senior consultant with Archaeological Management Solutions, and in this presentation I'll be introducing you to TII's new Cultural Heritage Impact Assessment Guidelines and Standards, which are currently under preparation. First, on behalf of AMS and TII, I'd like to thank the conference organisers for giving me this opportunity, and I'm sorry I'm not there with you in person. AMS was engaged by TII in late 2020 to prepare an overarching technical document that would give guidance about how to undertake and deliver cultural heritage impact assessments, and a standards document outlining cultural heritage requirements, including the production and delivery of outputs for inclusion with constraints reports, option selection reports, environmental impact assessment reports, and or environmental reports. Cultural heritage professionals undertaking impact assessments for TAI projects will be expected to adopt and adhere to these new guidelines and standards after their publication, which is anticipated to happen in the coming months. So this presentation is an important opportunity to find out more about this initiative and a chance to become familiar with some of the key elements of these new guidelines and standards. This presentation is divided into four sections. Number one, aims and objectives. What TII want to achieve in updating their cultural heritage guidelines? Two, process. How AMS on behalf of TII has gone about the work? Three, key elements of the new guidance and standards, including some of the main deliverables that TII will be requiring cultural heritage professionals to deliver. And four, finally, future engagement opportunities. How you can have your say before the final drafts are produced. So first I want to share the aims and objectives that were set out in the project brief. The key deliverables of the project are overarching guidance and standards regulating the assessment of impacts on cultural heritage of projects funded by or carried out under the auspices of TII. The guidance and standards will address the key principles of cultural heritage impact assessment and will be applicable to all planning and design project phases. New guidance and standards will replace the 2005 NRA guidelines for the assessment of archaeological heritage and architectural heritage impacts of national road schemes to reflect recent developments such as the amended EIA directive, the requirements of TI's project management guidelines and project appraisal guidelines, and new technologies. The NRA guidelines, published in 2005, have been a valuable tool for cultural heritage practitioners undertaking impact assessments and related work on behalf of TII. But they've reached a point where they need to be brought up to date and into alignment with other guidance, such as TII's new landscape and visual impact assessment guidelines, published in December 2020, and with TII's project management and project appraisal guidelines, which have undergone numerous iterations over the recent years. The new cultural heritage guidelines also aim to reflect the requirements of the amended EIA Directive of 2014, which has brought about some key changes in how EIAs are to be undertaken, not least the requirement that EIA reports are to be compiled by competent experts. The EPA published draft guidelines in 2017 based on this amended directive, which are in the process of being finalised, and the new TII guidelines have been developed to align with these. We've also seen some significant technological advances since 2005, including LiDAR and drones, a massive improvement in the availability of satellite photography and historical mapping, and a huge amount of digital research material and geospatial data, which is now available online. These advances put an enormous amount of information at our disposal, but at the same time increased the volume of information that we have to deal with. So the new guidance and standards will outline the sorts of information consultants are expected to use, at what stage, and to what level of detail. They emphasise that the level of analysis needs to be proportionate to the nature and scale of the project, and to the phase and stage of the design and environmental evaluation. Under the EIA directive and regulations, the focus needs to be on identifying, avoiding, and where necessary, mitigating significant adverse effects on cultural heritage. The other big technological advance, of course, is spatial data and the use of geographical information systems, or GIS. GIS is increasingly used to compile, store, and interrogate spatial heritage data, analyze impacts, compare options, plan and undertake field work, including recording data in the field, as well as presenting findings in map form and sharing it with TII, local authorities, other cultural heritage specialists, and the general public. So there's a big focus in the new guidelines on GIS, including the types of data that need to be captured and in what format, and how spatial data is to be presented in terms of mapping for reports. 
We've also looked at international best practice in terms of cultural heritage assessment and protection. This includes adopting internationally accepted definitions of what constitutes the cultural heritage and its various components, as well as looking at approaches being undertaken elsewhere that we can draw on, for example Australia, where intangible heritage, elicited through direct consultation with knowledge holders, is often a key focus of inquiry. So how have AMS and TII gone about addressing these aims and objectives and compiling the new standards and guidance? The project has been overseen by a technical steering committee made up of members of the AMS team and senior TII personnel. Within the AMS project team, we have archaeological consultants based here in Ireland and the UK, as well as our own built heritage specialists, spatial data specialists, and people with experience in intangible heritage. The project team also has reached back to the wider EIA, project archaeology, and excavation teams, who have provided input on the various drafts. In addition, we have external specialists on the project, including a World Heritage Specialist, Industrial Heritage Specialist, Conservation Architects, and an Illustrator. We also set up a project advisory group, which includes key agencies such as the National Monument Service and National Museum of Ireland, and the IAI. This expertise has been further enhanced by the involvement of TII's project archaeologists through a series of workshops undertaken throughout the Commission with TII's archaeology and heritage team, as well as engagement with external stakeholders from a range of organisations, government and non-government, and other interested parties. The guidance document has also been subject to peer review by Historic Environment Scotland and Arab Consulting Engineers. And earlier this year, we had a public consultation period, which is widely advertised on social media and disseminated through the public participation network, where the general public was given the opportunity to review and comment on the new guidance. All these inputs represent a level of engagement and collaboration that is unprecedented in the development of any TII publication to date. The first major project task was to carry out a literature review of over 200 documents, including treaties, conventions and declarations on archaeological, architectural and intangible cultural heritage, national legislation, the EIA directive and EPA guidelines, policy frameworks relating to heritage protection and sustainable development, the codes of practice of TII and others, other guidance, standards and advice notes, including international guidance, as well as reports and other research. The next step was to formulate definitions to break down the category of cultural heritage as an environmental factor for EIA into its component parts, recognising interrelated and overlapping aspects. For the purposes of TII's new guidelines, cultural heritage has been taken to incorporate archaeological heritage, built heritage, including architectural and industrial heritage, tangible heritage, including portable heritage such as archaeological objects, and intangible cultural heritage and we provide examples of all these in the guidelines for illustration purposes. The definitions for each of these aspects are based on a combination of pre-existing definitions, drawn mainly from the Council of Europe, UNESCO and ICOMOS, and national legislation, as well as professional experience, and early drafts of the definitions generated a lot of useful discussion from stakeholders. From there, the process was to produce the two documents which have gone through multiple rounds of review and revision by TI and AMS staff with the input of external stakeholders and experts along the way. Draft 1 of the guidance was issued to TII and the external specialist in February 2021. This was a rough working draft to get things moving and over 650 comments from TII and the specialists and stakeholders were catalogued to help guide the second draft. Draft 2, issued in April 2021, went for review by external agencies, as well as the peer review. Draft 3 was issued for public consultation earlier this year, and Draft 4 was submitted to TII in mid-March. Draft 5 will be the final draft, which we're working on at the moment, but there is still a window of opportunity for practitioners to provide input. More on that before I wrap up. There isn't time to go through everything that the new guidance and standards contain, so I'm just going to quickly introduce the documents and some of the key concepts and deliverables that professionals will need to produce or have input to. The overarching technical document provides detailed guidance on cultural heritage impact assessment. It sets out the regulatory and policy context and provides guidance on scope and methodologies used in the assessment of impacts, as well as the mitigation of significant adverse effects. 
It also provides guidance on the content and format of key deliverables to ensure consistency of approach and adherence to high levels of quality. There's a comprehensive glossary of terms, abbreviations and acronyms, supporting information sources and other relevant guidelines. The standards document outlines the minimum standards that cultural heritage professionals are expected to deliver, illustrated with examples. The new guidelines and standards are structured around the phases and stages set out in TII's Project Management Guidelines, or PMG. Cultural Heritage Impact Assessment is a process that extends across PMG phases 2 to 4, and within each phase the cultural heritage input seeks to minimise adverse effects and enhance opportunities for cultural heritage wherever possible, using a four-step process for each iteration of planning and design. Step 1. Establish scope and define or refine the study area or assessment corridors depending on the project phase. Step 2. Compile a cultural heritage data set and analyse data gathered through desktop research and fieldwork to establish the cultural heritage baseline. Step 3. Identify and describe the likely impacts on cultural heritage and assess the significance of the effects. And step 4. Set out suitable mitigation or enhancement measures to be considered during option selection and design, including measures to be implemented during construction and operation of the project post-consent. At the commencement of each phase or stage, cultural heritage professionals will need to submit a working paper for approval by TII. The working paper is a method statement that briefly sets out the names of the professionals who will undertake the assessment and their credentials, the objectives for cultural heritage, that is, to minimise adverse effects and enhance opportunities, the level of assessment to be undertaken, which will be commensurate with the nature and scale of the project, the PMG phase or stage, and the required assessment and approvals processes, as well as the nature of the receiving cultural heritage environment. The study area, or assessment corridors, including any variations recommended for cultural heritage. Assumptions and proposed actions. Cultural heritage receptor types to be included. The sources of information, fieldwork, and any specialist surveys and consultations to be carried out. Methodology for measuring distances between cultural heritage receptors and project options. Criteria for determining the importance of cultural heritage receptors. Methodology for options appraisal, MCA and impact assessment, as well as the format and contents of deliverables, including cultural heritage data sets, reports, figures and so on. The cultural heritage data set is a structured data set containing information relevant to each identified cultural heritage asset or receptor, including, but not limited to, geospatial data. The data set can be produced and analysed using spreadsheets, databases and GIS. Outputs generated from these include reports, tables, statistics, maps and drawings as required. All relevant cultural heritage assets should be included in the CHD, whether archaeological, built heritage or other cultural heritage. Each entry should be associated with vector data, representing its location, and depending on the phase of the project, its known or reasonably assumed extents. The CHD is critical to the efficient assessment and mitigation of impacts, and will be submitted as part of the outputs for each phase or stage. The CHD shall also be presented in a suitable format for inclusion as an appendix to the EIAR or EOR. The guidelines include a suggested structure and content of the CHD which can be tailored to suit the nature and scale of the project and the phase and stage of the assessment in consultation with the TII assigned project archaeologist. Mapping derived from the CHD is to be submitted in GIS or CAD format and the guidance and standards give direction on how to map assessment corridors and cultural heritage assets at the various stages, starting with a constraint study covering a large area, then going through the option selection process and finally honing in on the preferred option that will ultimately go for planning approval and construction. The level of detail within the CHD and the assessment itself gradually increases as the geographical scope of study decreases and more research and fieldwork is carried out. Throughout the PMG phases, cultural heritage professionals will also need to submit a project archive for each iteration of assessment. This archive will comprise the CHD and associated spatial data in GIS or CAD, completed reports in PDFA format, impact assessment spreadsheets, and any other cultural heritage data or records generated by the assessment, 
including, for example, LIDAR and geophysical survey raw data. At phase three, field survey forms and other records are added into the project archive, along with photographs and any consultations with third parties. This is very important, as such documentation may be needed to support evidence presented at oral hearing. Similarly, the project archive produced at phase four is in effect a handover pack to enable efficient implementation of mitigation measures, including the services to be carried out by the archaeological contractor post-consent. It's highly likely that post-consent services will be undertaken under a separate contract to the Cultural Heritage Impact Assessment, so the information handed over needs to be complete and accurate to ensure the efficient procurement and delivery of services, including the commitments made within the EIAR. Some of the other topics covered in the new guidance includes the roles of the project manager and project archaeologist, TI's role as a planning enforcement authority, EIA and related assessment processes, how to rate the importance of cultural heritage assets, how to describe impacts and assess significance of effect in line with EPA guidance, how to assess cumulative effects and describe residual impacts, how to have input to the multi-criteria analysis, which estimates the likely impact of interventions on the environment and other factors. We look at the various forms of mitigation to avoid, prevent, reduce or remedy or offset significant effects. We outline the contents of cultural heritage mitigation plans and EIA report chapters. And we look at post-consent works, including enabling and procurement of services to implement the cultural heritage mitigations. So you can see there's a lot in there. And the guidance document in particular is shaping up to be a very comprehensive resource for cultural heritage practitioners. As we enter the final round of drafting, following the public consultation period earlier this year, there is still an opportunity for you to have input into these new guidelines and standards. You can do this by visiting the project webpage at www.ams-consultancy.com forward slash TII guidance and standards project, all lowercase and hyphenated. There you can register your interest by subscribing to receive further updates on the project by email. You can also participate in an upcoming Practitioner's Workshop, the date of which will be announced shortly. So after registering on the webpage, keep an eye on your emails and the AMS social media pages and TII's Archaeology News webpage for further announcements. You can also email me directly at brin.coldrick at ams-consultancy.com with any queries or concerns you might have. So that concludes the presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.